recommend you look at that $1,400 to $1,800 rental. I believe those areas you will still see very significant rent growth and the demand will be uh, insatiable. There, 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 there's no way the U.S. government would have to start building 100,000 projects a month to ever put a dent in the demand for housing. There's just not enough places for the human beings in America to go. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. The time to get private money for your real estate deals is when you do not need it for a real estate deal. So now is the time to get private money. I tell you, the worst time to raise private money is when you're actually needing the money for a particular real estate deal. Well, my guest in this episode of Raising Private Money has raised private money to invest in over 2,000 houses and also over 1,500 apartment units. My guest, Tim Herridge, knows how to raise private money. Tim's going to share how to find private money and how to get the money chasing you. Tim will also reveal what you can expect in this crazy, chaotic real estate market from now through the end of 2023. So if you want more private money than you can spend, don't miss a second of this episode. Let's dive in right now. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and also your host here on the show. And I'm so excited to have a fellow mastermind member joining me here on the show today uh, that has got a ton of experience when it comes to raising private money. Um, boy, has he got the credentials and the, and the experience. He's the executive director of RC and Capital, also the host of the uncontested investing show. And he's like you and like me, he's a professional real estate investor, entrepreneur for at least 20 years. He's been on the leading edge of the real estate investor space. Now this includes being the founder of a 2020 REI group, co-founder, managing director of Blackstone's uh, Finance, which is now called Finance of America. Uh, he's the founder of the uh, REI Expo. Uh, he's a franchisee. He's a development agent for home investors. A ton of experience. And on top of that, he's completed well over $2 billion, that's with a B, over $2 billion in real estate investment transactions, uh, which includes 2,000 houses, 1,500 apartment units, more than 100,000 square feet of commercial, and more than 10,000 loans to real estate investors. So uh, he knows how to raise private money and he knows how to loan it out as well. I'm so excited to have Tim Herridge join me on the show. Tim, you are an amazing individual when it comes to raising private money. You've raised a ton of private money. So let me ask you, what was your investing business prior to private money, that is, if you had experience prior to private money, and how did private money change your real estate investing career? I think before really uh, building up my own stockpile of available capital, um, you know, you, you're really at the whim of uh, deal partners, uh, joint venture partners, and uh, 20 years ago, the hard money lenders that wanted to charge you 14% and four. So, uh, you know, it, it's, I really started just at the bootstrapping level. So uh, private money really in 07 became a necessity for me. Same thing for me, Tim. Um, I started full-time investing in single family houses in 2003. And my first six years, 
I relied on the local bank. That's all I knew. I didn't know anything else. I'd never heard of hard money. I'd never heard of private money. In fact, I had never even heard of buying houses on terms and all that kind of stuff. I thought you just went to the bank and borrowed your money. And I tell you, Tim, I remember it like it was yesterday. I called up my banker in January 2009. So you see, I didn't know we had a global financial crisis going on until 2009 when I called up my banker and my line of credit had been shut down with no notice. Now I've got a financial crisis, right? (laughs) And, you know, my definition of coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. I learned about private money the very same day that I got caught off from the bank. I just called up one of my friends that was a real estate investor in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I said, how are you funding your deals? Because he'd been cut off too. He told me about private money. I learned about it. I put my program together and I put my teacher hat on and I started teaching my network what private money is all about. And, and um, yeah, I was able to raise not 2 billion, but I was able to raise over 2 million in less than uh, 90 days. So Tim, how did you start with private money? How did you start attracting people to, you know, loan you money for your real estate deals? Well, one of my partners in early in my uh, business life, he was also a hard money lender and, I would say more than 50% of his uh, capital that he loaned out was, you know, to the, from the investors that had thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 invested with him. So I watched him do it and I understood it kind of from uh, observation and, and being near it. But uh, there was an old man named, uh, not was, he's still here. He's still a good family friend of ours, um, uh, Clayton. And Clayton just kind of became friends. He was an old high school football, basketball coach. And, uh, when, it, when our bank line got called in April of 08, um, and we, we, you, people listening to this thinking, well, I may never need private money. The, the most inter- interesting thing looking back at that period, if I may segue a little, is it was the ones that thought it, it was the good borrowers, the, the strong borrowers, the ones who weren't behind on payments, the ones that uh, had 100 percent occupancy. It was those of us that got our lines called and and uh, got our lines non-renewed. And ultimately, looking back now as an institutional lender, what I understand is the bank had a really good feeling that I would do what it took to get the loan paid off. Whereas the ones that were already behind or had a 50 percent vacancy rate or, or, or maybe didn't have the liquidity or credit we did, uh, the banks gave them workouts. Right. Like they got they got they got like lower interest and longer to pay. So. When I look back at it, um, it, it happened almost on accident. And I guess it's an industry as old as time, Jay. We had been doing a lot of business uh, uh, helping Mr. Uh, Clayton uh, sell his his personal house and said, well, what are you going to do with that half a million dollars? And he said, I'm going to stick it in the bank. And we said, man, you know, we could do this and, and pay you that. And he had never made 8% interest before in his life. And he's uh, he was just more worried about actually preserving his capital with us since he trusts us than even the, the income, but the income turned out well for him. So, you know, when you really look at it, it was, uh, you know, the Chinese symbol for chaos and opportunity are the same. And I feel like the chaos of 08 uh, pushed us towards the opportunity of raising that capital that time. Well, Tim, I just heard you say three takeaways that is worth pointing out um, to uh, our listener. And that is, first of all, you said that the gentleman sold his house. He's got this cash coming. He was going to put it in the bank. Well, right there's a takeaway. I have gotten private money from private lenders that have just sold real estate. And I knew they had cash coming to them. So, you know, one popular question and common question I get all the time is, well, you know, who are the people that are loaning you money? Um, and right there's a great category, people that are selling real estate that have cash coming in. Another takeaway I heard you say is he'd never received 8%. So you're going to pay him 8%. That's exactly what I pay my private lenders today. And I'll tell you, Tim, with the craziness in the market today of interest rates going crazy high, guess what? My private lenders are still at 8%. They've been at 8% since 2009. And the thing of it is, is even though 
the local certificate of deposit for 12 months has gone from 0.17% for a 12 month yield to last week, it was 0.97%, still less than 1%. Where else are they going to get 8%? Another takeaway I just heard you say is he trusted you. And so I would venture to say that you would agree with me when it comes to doing business with private lenders, trust, even though you're collateralizing the note and giving them a mortgage or deed of trust, would you agree trust um, plays into the factor rather strongly as to whether they, the private lender does business with you or not? You know, Jay, in the 14 years that we've been doing business with Clayton, because he's almost 85 now, we still cycle his money a couple times a year. The only time that he's ever kind of, I hate to say gotten squirrely, but the only time that I've ever really sensed hesitancy in him was when something didn't happen the exact way I said it would on a property, right? We're going to buy this house, fix this house, sell this house, and pay it back in three months. And we always communicate in advance, but it's always been interesting that even after we borrowed and repaid millions from him, if you if if you're Plans change, I, it, it, it increases their, I'd say, not skepticism, but worry, and decreases trust a little bit. And so my wife and I finally have gotten to the point to where we just make sure it happens the way we said it was going to, whether the project goes or not, that way or not. And that's, that's probably been the reason that we've attracted even more capital since, since then. Right. So uh, back to uh, that common question I hear all the time, where do you find private lenders? Well, I mean, you've got a huge network. And so I know you can answer that question in more than one category, but how would you identify where, where your private lenders come from either to invest in your fund or invest, but well, let's keep it to the question of they're actually investing in, you know, real estate itself as one of your private lenders. Where do you find them? You know, the bulk of our investors in anything we've done have been local friends and friends of family and um, uh, business colleagues, people that we respect in business here locally. Uh, I live in a town called Rockwall. It's to the east of Dallas. Um, I, I think now, though, really and truly, the bulk of the funds come from people that have just heard about us. And because... It's just a referral source. It's it's we do right by people and people like to brag. They like to go tell their friends, I'm getting eight percent, even though the CD's half, uh, half a percent. And then they, you know, people call you. So I, I think it all started, it's been a waterfall effect of starting in um locally with people that we already knew us and liked us and making showing them how they could trust us. And then uh, just uh, doing what you say you're going to do and then getting referrals. You know, what's interesting about what you just said, Tim, is I've got the same experience. So when we started out attracting, raising private money, which, by the way, I don't know if you've done business this way or not, but I've never asked anybody for money. I've never asked them for money. They say, Jay, have you got, you know, eight and a half million dollars that you run around on different house projects, you know, all the time. And you never ask for any anybody for money? And the answer is I teach them first what my private lending program is. I've never pitched a deal. I never talked to anybody about needing money or wanting money. And I got a deal that I need it for. I already sound like I'm begging without even trying. But anyway, I had the same experience as you. Um, so I've got, we've got four, my wife and I, we've got 44 private lenders right now that are funding our deals, Tim. And did you know not one of them, not one of them had ever heard of private money and private lending and what it was. And none of them had heard of self-directed IRAs and how they can move retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA and then loan that money out and be a passive investor. Um, did you pretty much have the same experience with your private lenders? Yeah. And I, I don't know if any of them even know that they're private lenders, honestly. <laughs> Uh, I think most of them just really do think that Tim and Jennifer invest in real estate and they see what Tim and Jennifer do and Tim and Jennifer pay them to use their money to help their business. I, I don't even know if they realize they're lenders, Jay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, another question that I get uh, every now and then, they say, 
Jay, if you're making all that money and doing all those real estate deals, which by the way, I don't do that many. I do two to three single family houses a month. Most of them we fix and flip now, but our average profits now in our little teeny tiny area of 40,000 people is now $74,000 per flip. So that math works out, but um, they will, you know, another common question I get is, well, Jay, why are you still borrowing private money for your deals? Why don't you just use your own cash and you don't, you know, you don't have to pay 8%, you know, to somebody else. And um, of course my answer, and I want to see what your answer is. My answer is, well, when I've got 20 projects going, I don't want all my own money buried in my projects and be real estate rich and cash poor. What would your answer be to that, uh, Tim? My answer would be hop on over to Google and look up the Oracle of Real Estate. It's an interview Warren Buffett did in March of 2017. He bought a beach house in Laguna Beach for $150,000. He took a $120,000 mortgage. And the CNBC lady at the, uh, on the interview said, well, why would you have taken a mortgage? Surely you didn't need it. And Buffett said something that was very astute and I think summarizes my answer and feelings towards your question. He said, I guess I thought the interest rate was attractive and I could, do, I could make more with the money they loaned me than I paid them for loaning me the money. And he used the example that was in 1971 when he was buying Berkshire Hathaway very actively at $40 a share. So he extrapolated that to where he could have bought 3,000 shares of Berkshire Hathaway with the $120,000 he borrowed. So conversely, from 1971 to 2017, that house was worth $11 million, which sounds like an amazing thing. It went from $150,000 to $11 million. Well, the $120,000 he borrowed and he bought 3,000 shares of Berkshire Hathaway with ended up being worth $750 million. So wow. I don't care how much money you have, leverage as long as the debt is cheaper than what you can make with the cash, leverage is always the best bet, no matter how much money you have. Wow. You know, I never heard of that interview and I am for sure going to um, go listen to it. And the next time somebody asks me, Jay, why don't you just use your own cash? I'm going to say, well, have you heard the interview with Warren Buffett called the Oracle of Real Estate? And I'm really going to sound smart. Actually, I will give you credit, Tim. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was giving it, CJ, people also don't understand why people like you and I spend our time teaching and educating. I was speaking at a conference in Florida in September, and I was looking for, I, I just literally sat down and Googled best quotes about 30-year mortgages. <laughs> I was just going through looking for people that smarter than me, more accomplished than me, more reputable than me that had talked about it. And I'm telling you, Jay, it was a two minute and 54 second interview. It was like three minutes long. And I was just like, man, I could just get up there and play that and not even have to speak. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I tell you what, Tim, um, let's give away a gift to our listeners uh, about halfway here through this interview. I'm so excited, Tim. I just recently start, um, I, I started and finished writing the, my new private money guide, and it's called Seven Reasons Why Private Money Will Skyrocket Your Real Estate Business and Help You Build Incredible Wealth. And um, if you are interested in getting a lot of private money very, very fast and getting on the fast track to private money, you can download it for free at jayconner.com, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. That's jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. Now, in addition to all that, uh, Tim, you raise private money, but you also lend out to real estate investors. So um, tell me about your capital fund and how that works and and, you know, how our listeners can, um, you know, do bit, possibly do business with your, uh, with your company on loaning out money. Yes, yeah, so RCN Capital, we've done uh, almost uh, close to 5,000 loans this year, a little over $1.2 billion. And um, we're a private lender. We're not a hard money lender. We're not a bank. 
we um we loan money to real estate investors for single family, multifamily, and mixed use properties on uh, fix and flip, long term rental, and ground up construction. Now we do have credit guidelines. There's a minimum credit score. We do have minimum loan amounts. We're definitely nowhere as rigid as a bank. We have we're nationwide, so we have a lot more coverage than your local hard money person. I like to think we fall kind of in the middle. We try to be very relationship oriented. So for instance, if you're doing a fix and flip deal on your first deal, uh, if it's the first one you've ever done, you probably have to put 20% down. If it's the fifth one you've ever done, you probably have to put around 15 to 10% down. If it's the 30th one you've done in the last three years, we can do zero down. So it's it's we, we grow the relationship with the customer. We don't have really rigid lines uh, and, and um, we're, we're a very large company that had, uh, we always have the money to lend. So uh, I think we, we fill the gap uh, when uh, people tap out on their private money with their, lo- with their local individuals, or maybe they uh, have a larger opportunity than their private money database feels comfortable with. Um, we like to fill that gap. That's awesome. Well, you know, you are probably, well, I would call you a hybrid lender. You're not hard. You're not private. You're sort of there in the middle but uh, other than now with my private lenders, um, it's all no down payment. And in fact, when I'm rehabbing, I bring home a check, right? When I buy for, for the rehab, of course, that's not going to happen in, in the hard money world, but you're the only even hybrid lender that I have uh, met and know that actually has a no down. I'm sure there's some others out there. I just haven't heard of them. An actual no down payment program for people that's got experience so, so Tim, what can you do for me since I've rehabbed and flipped over 450 houses? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, Jay, uh, it, it's, it's all different, right? I mean, we have to look at liquidity, right? Because we require monthly payments. We have, we have to look at your down payments at the amount of, you know, how much debt you've got in place and you're taking on. Um, and, and, and I mean, a guy like you, I'm pretty sure we could do, up to 75 loan to value, 100% loan to cost on both purchase and rehab. But we're not going to let you take that money home with you from closing. <laughs> no, that only happens in the in the in the in the true world of private money. So, um, well, that's fantastic. Well, Tim, we are in crazy, chaotic times. And before we started the show, you and I were talking about how every time when chaos does come along, that also breeds opportunity simultaneously. So let me just open this up. Where do you see where we are today? And where do you see us going in the next year or two? I know nobody's got a crystal ball, but with your experience, I would listen to you ahead of a lot of other people. I feel like the Fed's going to go ahead and raise uh, at least the next two meetings. Um, I feel like mortgage interest rates may not go up that much, because the spreads between the 10-year treasury and the actual 30-year mortgage, they got really wide pretty early. Um, and, and normally they're like one and a half percent above the 10-year. Right now they're like two and a half percent above. Uh, and, and that's primarily because of the fear of the bond market of kind of like where rates are going. Anyway, what that's doing is it's choking out the middle class. Uh, and... and in the middle class, the median home price, the lower middle home price, they are just not able to, uh, they can't buy. So it's forcing them into rentership. Um, it, the I would call the stock market crowd, the vacation rental crowd, the high-end luxury crowd, they're, 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 they're taking the beating so much in the equities markets and the rates are so high. I think that's pushing them a little bit farther down the ladder if they need to move. But anyone that doesn't need to move right now isn't going to move. And then ultimately, Jay, you got to look at the impact of these four years of super low interest rates. Uh, I was reading the other day, 90% of active mortgages are below 5%. So it's going to be hard to unseat those existing homeowners. And then you look at the fact that there's no building going on right now. Builders have all but stopped. Um, it, it, it's it's worsening a, a an all-time record in horrible supply 
has now gotten worse. So I feel like it's going to be a slingshot. The market is pulling back. I feel like it's going to get right back where it was uh, sometime late next year once rates go down a little bit and once the the sky isn't falling. Um, but we, we've got a crisis on our hands, Jay. Uh, the, there, there is just not enough shelter for humans. So I think if you are in a market where you can have median home price or median apartment price, uh, rent per square foot or monthly rent or below, I feel like you load the boat on that right now because a lot of it's on sale. A lot of it is is turning over. So I feel like that is the opportunity that's being created out of this chaos. You know, it was about two months ago. Maybe, no, 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 it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It was more like four weeks to six weeks ago. Uh, I saw a report and the report said the the 30 year in fact I, I know where I was I was out in Las Vegas so it was less it was less than four weeks ago the 30 year mortgage um uh prior to rates starting to go up crazy like they have the 30 year mortgage that was seventeen hundred dollars a month is now twenty six hundred dollars a month and you know that's a big gap between who can afford 1700 and who can afford 2600 and you know with the way rates are moving i mean it, the gap may even be uh, you know more than that here in our local area in eastern north carolina it's just it's like you got two polar opposite um variables that are like Pull, that are like pulling the real estate market two different ways. And you just set them both. One is you got the crazy interest rates and you just got millions and millions and millions of people that just can't buy that could have bought, you know, a year and a half ago. But then you look at the supply and the demand. We have no supply. I mean, here in Moorhead City, North Carolina, um, there are less than, 10 houses on the market in the MLS, less than $500,000. So, you know, so I heard you say a moment ago, it's like a slingshot. You think the values are going to go back up towards the end of next year because you think mortgage rates are going to start coming back down. Yeah, because ultimately, Jay, you hit on like the ultimate metric is, is the quantity of homes sold at a certain price. And right now, what you have is just the only thing selling is motivated sellers. That's it. Otherwise, you you, you don't have your house on the market. Otherwise, well, like, well, well, number one, if you sell it, as you said a moment ago, who wants to go from four and a half percent or five percent to, you know, over seven percent or whatever it is? And the other problem is, where are you going to go? Right. <laughs> Where are you going to go? Even if you can afford it, where are you going to go? That's, I mean, that's the, it, it, it's, it is a massive tug of war right now between supply and demand. And, you know, the Federal Reserve, their entire strategy, it's really what should happen. I agree with it. It's demand destruction. The only way they can control prices is to destroy demand and cars, real estate, food, energy are just huge drivers. The problem is it's, it's, it's only hurting the renters because there's just less houses available than we need. And every day that Delta grows. Mm -hmm. So you said it, but I want you to say it again. So where is the opportunity in the midst of this chaos? Affordable rental housing. So 70 to 90 percent of the median home price or 79 70 to 90 percent of the median rent amount for your market so if the median rent for your market is two thousand dollars a month i recommend you look at that fourteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollar rental i believe those areas you will still see very significant rent growth and the demand will be uh, insatiable. There, 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 there's no way 
the U.S. government would have to start building 100,000 projects a month to ever put a dent in the demand for housing. There's just not enough places for the human beings in America to go. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Tim, uh, wow, I could talk to you for hours. Um, let's tell uh, your website how people can get in contact with you for uh, RCN Capital. And, uh, and also, what's the best way for them to start to, you know, actually see, you know, what kind of business they could do with you. So give out your website, contact info, and what's the best way for someone to get started? Yes, yeah, so rcncapital.com. Check us out. Sign up on our email list. If you have a property you think about financing, hit me up, hit us up. If you're just wanting to stay connected, look up at Tim Harridge at any of the social medias. I'm there. I'm the only one, I think. Uh, but I think that the biggest thing I want to tell people to do is you – don't want to look for money when you need it. <laughs> you need to, Ain't that the truth? <laughs> yeah. You've got to look for money when you don't need it. So if you're even if you're just getting started, get to know me, take Jay's course, start talking to your friends. You may end up having a friend that has a lot of money that has been researching this on bigger pockets for 25 years. And it's just been waiting for a deal partner that was ready to take the run with it. That'll be your number one lender. So just you got to start having conversations, immerse yourself in the right crowds, start raising capital. Now, dry powder will win. I mean, the opportunity that will be created in the next 12 months, I think, is going to be very substantial. I couldn't agree with you more, Tim. And you know what I preach all the time because I did it and it works and that is the money comes first. I tell people all the time what you just said. The worst time to be raising capital is when you need it for a deal. And you like, you know, and I'm not going to call any names, Tim, but I have got a uh, I got a good friend uh, who is very well known and 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 this particular person uh teaches uh go get the go get the the real estate, go get the deal in the contract. The money will show up. And I go where? <laughs> the day, last week, there was a $20 million multifamily deal that landed on my desk that they were at the 12th hour and they had not been able to raise all their money. And I invest in multifamily syndications, like I told you before. I, I, my group brought $5 million, but they had to give up half of the general partnership because either that or they're going to walk away from their $500,000 non-refundable. And I hate to sound like that, but you know, the, the guy with the money gets the is it, it can be the shark at the end of the deal. So you, mm -hmm. want, you want to have that money lined up in terms of greed before you really need it. Absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. It's just been fantastic having you. Well, thank you for having me, man. I, I, I've always been a big fan of yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Tim. So uh, there you have it, uh, my friend. Um, go to www.rcncapital.com. Dot com rcncapital.com and uh, you can also follow Tim uh, Harridge on his uh, social media uh, he spells his last name h e r r i a g e Tim Harridge and uh, he is all over the place on social so there you have it another episode of raising private money with Jay Connor I'm the private money authority wishing you all the best and I need your help yes yours I need your help I need you to share this episode with at least just one friend that you believe it would uh, give it valuable information and inspire as well. If you're watching on uh, YouTube, by the way, be sure and click that bell so you don't miss any more amazing episodes. And I really appreciate the five stars and the reviews. We'll be seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.